Well, this is a piece of poplar that I've turned into a model of an interior door. This is the interior jam set, and it's dadoed into the sides, a lot like the window frame that we did earlier. This piece on the bottom wouldn't be on a real door, but I put it on here to hold this frame rigid. On the real door, I'll replace this with a spreader that'll hold the jam sides apart. This is the inside stop, and the distance from here to here is the same thickness as the thickness of the door. But on this side, this stop is set back an additional 1 16th of an inch, greater than the thickness of the door. And that's to prevent this edge from binding when the door is closed. But as you see, this door won't close, and it's for a different reason. This edge is square, and it needs to be beveled. Doors swing on an arc, and the center of the arc is the center of the hinge pin. I'll use my divider to demonstrate. I'll put one leg of the divider right on the center of the hinge pin and the other leg on the edge of the door. And when I swing it, you can see that part of the arc. That's how you find the amount of bevel, but usually three to five degrees would be enough. Well, here's the required bevel, and I'll scribe a line all the way down the edge. I like to use old hand planes. This one's nice and sharp, and when I start, I'll only be making a narrow cut on the one side and it'll get wider as I go along. I use my hand against the edge to guide it with, and you see I lift the plane on the return stroke, only putting pressure on the forward stroke. Otherwise, you'll dull the iron. Okay, that looks good. And the margins look good. The margins should be equal all the way around. In the old days, they used to call it nickel and dime. That means that they used a dime for a thickness gauge on the hinge side and a nickel on the latch side. And I use a nickel across the top. Now this door is a little bit greater than that, and that's because it's winter and the door is contracted. In the summertime, it'll be tight. So if you fit your doors in the winter, make this a loose nickel. In the summer, make it tight. Sometimes these margins can be closed by paint buildup. And if you have to reduce the size of the door, take it off of the hinge side and then reset the hinges. You can see that the mortise for this hinge leaves the surface flush with the edge of the door. And I've left about 3 16 of an inch here. And that lets the barrel of the hinge project out beyond the face of the jam so that the trim will fit. Well, here's something else about hinges. Hinges are bent, and that's called swaging, so that when the leaves are closed, they'll be parallel. Here's the diamond here again, and that's a parallel joint, but they're not always like that. You need to check your hinges to check the swage, because you might have to make this mortise a little deep or a little shallow to control the margin on the side. Well, there's another way to change this margin, and that's called throwing the hinge. You can shim behind the hinge leaf and that will move, move the door either this way or that way. But I'll tell you a lot more about throwing the hinge on the next doors that I'll hang. Whenever I can, I like to use my old hand tools that I was taught with. This is a joiner plane, my hand saws, which are sometimes faster than a skill saw, a jack plane, some specialty markers, and specialty planes. But the next door is going to be done in production bases, and so I use the electric ones, a router, electric plane, skill saw and drill. And now I'll get right to it. Here we are back on the inside of the house. This is the 2x4 wall with the half inch drywall on the sides. This is the jam set and the hollow core interior door. A lot of people use pre-hung doors and so do I, but I'd rather hang them in place. When I do that, I have to keep the time up and I'll have to use all the shortcuts I can. The first thing you need to do is measure the door. And this one is 30 inches. It's important to do that because a lot of them come downsized from the factory. Next is to cut the head, and I'll cut it 30 inches long, plus the depth of the two dados. Well, here's a handy way to make that measurement. Use your combination square as a depth gauge, and that's 3 eighths. After the head is cut the length, just nail the sides together. Six penny nails would be good enough. Three on each side will hold it. Well, door hanging is usually a one-man job. When you work by yourself, you learn to do a lot of tricks and shortcuts. 
I'll just take a shim shingle and nail it on the surface of the wall here. When the door jamb goes in place, that'll be sure that it's flush with the surface of the wall. This way, I can concentrate on the bottom and the top will hold itself. This piece of wood is the spreader and it holds the bottom of the jam 30 inches apart, exactly the same as it is on the top. Put some shim shingles in there to snug it up. There doesn't have to be perfect right now because it's going to have to be adjusted when you plumb the sides. Put the level across the top and make it just as level as you can get it. When I level this head, it raises the one end up. That makes a space on the floor. And since this is a finished floor, you want that to be flush. So you take a scriber and set it to this distance and transfer it to the other side. That needs to be cut off, so you need to take the jam out and put it on the bench. So when you put it back in place, both sides will be down on the floor and the head will be level. Now I'll mark the center of the door. This is 15 inches because it's a 30 inch opening. And now to be sure I get the same thing on the spreader, I'll put the spreader in place and then mark it. Square that across. I'll use this for the plumb bob. I use a four penny finish nail just to the side of the mark. Then when the string goes on, it covers the center line of the mark. You want to be accurate, and that does it. Just wrap the string around itself and hold it in place. You need to shift this over until it comes right in. That looks good. Snug up the other side. Be sure and always check it to make sure it lines up with the drywall. And then nail it up. I use two 8 penny finish nails at each shim location and again set them about 1 16th of an inch deep. Use five sets of shingles on each side, one the top and bottom, one right in the middle, and then a set between those. Later on I'll come back and be sure there are shingles behind the hinges and also between the latch plate on the other side. The other side is bowed in. I'll hold a straight edge with my knee. That'll free both hands and then I'll shim it and bring it right to line. Be sure to cut this off just below the surface so it'll be out of the way of the trim. If you can't cut it with a sharp utility knife, saw it off with a handsaw. Well that's how I go about setting an interior jam. And I use a plumb bob because it's fast and accurate. But you could also use a straight edge like this one. This has parallel sides, and I have a little block, one on the top and one on the bottom. Just put this against the jam side like that, and you can use any size level to check it with. When it's plumb, just flip it around. Use the straight edge for shimming. Now since this, this is just one door, I'll work on the door next, but if I had a whole house full of doors, I'd do everything in sequence. Set every jam and every door opening, come back and fit each door, come back again and hinge. Now I'll put the stops on and I'll be ready to cut this door. I'll set my square to the thickness of the door and this is one and three eighths. Then I'll scribe a line down the jam. Now on the hinge side, I'll gain a sixteenth.
The top piece of the stop is a square cut and is just pressure fit. And this is the side piece and this is a cope joint. I like cope joints better than miters because it makes a nice tight joint. And one way to be sure that it's tight, put a little wedge on the bottom. I'll just tack this up for now and when the door is in place, I might have to adjust it. All right, that takes care of the jam. Now I cut this for a 30 inch door, cut the head 30 inches because it's a 30 inch door. And I've saved myself a lot of trouble by making the jam side straight. This will be the hinge side and I'll mark it so I won't lose it. And then I'll need to cut these margins for the nickel and dime and I'll bevel it at the same time. But before I do that, I'll put my router template on here and route out for the hinges. Well, I made this template for doors that only need two hinges, top and bottom. But you can make one for three hinges or heavy doors, even sometimes use four. First you cut the perimeter of the hinge and then clean out the middle. This is a homemade router template and it's right tight here on the top and I'll show you how to make one of those in just a few minutes. The router bit leaves a round corner and I'm using square cornered hinges. So first of all I'll cut away the fuzz and then cut across the grain and with the grain so that it doesn't split. And I just pare out the corners. Now that the hinges are located, I can back them up with more shims. Well, this is a door bench. And it's made out of framing lumber and it's really easy to make. It has a stop here across the top. That'll hold the door in place, and you can adjust it for the door thickness. These rails across the bottom are adjustable so you can use different sized doors. There's a compartment on each end, and it's lower than the top, so your tools will be out of the way. It's a plywood bottom, which makes the frame more rigid, and it's open on the end, so you can sweep out all the sawdust and debris. The middle compartment is for you. You just climb in there and grab the rails, and walk away with it. The bench is only 22 inches wide, so it'll go through a narrow door. When you want to work on the top of the door, or cut it off, just pick it up and put it across the top. This is the top of the door, and there's my hinge mark so I wouldn't forget. And this template is reversible. Part that I have here on the top of the door was on the bottom of the jam. And here's my nickel spacing. Well, this is how this hinge template works. This is called a template guide, and it's bigger than this half inch bit. You make your cutout pattern, and that fits through there like that. You follow the outline, and the bit does the cutting. Well, cutting this mortise is just the same as it is in a jam, except here I have the advantage of gravity. Cut around the outside, then I clean out the center. Check it for flush. Square the corners again. This end is fragile, so be careful. And now mark the location of the screws. And then punch them with a nail set just off center towards the closed side. Now 
up, need to tighten that a little bit. You should always drill pilot holes for screws, especially in dense wood like this, so the screws won't split it out. When these screws are off center, you'll pull it nice and tight to the closed end. Well, this is the template guide that I used earlier, but I'll show you how to make one for yourself. This is a piece of half inch plywood with a cutout. And this cutout is the shape of the hinge. And I arrive at the size by taking the hinge and I use this space, which is the same as from the outside of the bit to the outside of the guide. Now I only need to worry about this size at the moment. This can be wider and I'll show you why in just a minute. First I'll lay out the hinge on the door. I use five inches here because it holds the door better but five, six, and seven inches are also standard. You wouldn't want this, and this isn't neat either. You should have a closed mortise, and also that'll keep the hinge pin away from the trim on the edge of the door. I'll start by putting a template over the layout on the door and judging equal margins. Not like that, but right there. Put a nail in it to hold it there until you put the strip on. Same thing on the bottom. Well, this is a piece of three-quarter square pine, and I'll use it for a connecting strip. Put a couple of spots of glue on. Put it in place, and hold it there with drywall screws. Same thing on the bottom. Well, this template is exactly the same as the one on the top. This is five inches from here to the hinge. The only difference is on the bottom hinge, it's 10 inches from the bottom of the door to the finished cut of the hinge. I'll tell you more about that in the booklet. Well, this electric plane is about 25 years old, but it still works really well. It has an adjustable fence. I'll check the square and then set the bevel by eye. It's about five degrees. Make a series of cuts. The first one will be narrow and they'll get progressively wider as I go down. I like to use old hand planes, but electric planes are for speed. You can see the bevel on the machine, and now you can see it on the edge of the door. It's ready to hang now. I'll try it and see how it fits. Mate these hinges, put the top pin in, the bottom pin, and close it and check the margins. Well, that's pretty tight, but it looks like this hinge is sagging. There was some movements on that pin, so I'll take that out by throwing the hinge. Just a little piece of cardboard shim that came from the box that the hinges were packed in. If I take this leaf loose and put the cardboard in this position, it'll move the barrel that way. And if I were to put it over on this edge, it would move it this way. I'm going to put it behind here to close this margin up. That takes care of it. There's a dime. And there's the nickel. The lock set's next. And there's that 34 to 36 inches off the floor. I'll make this one 36 inches. But just in case you have a pre-finished door, or one that you don't want to make marks on before it's stained, don't mark directly on the door. Put a piece of masking tape on it. Now I'll put the 36 inch mark up here and square that around the door. Cross the face, 
the edge, and the other side. Now I'll mark the back set, and this lock is 2 and 3 8, so I'll set my combination square, make this mark, and then mark the other side. But I'll have to put two marks on this side. This is 2 and 3 8, but the door is beveled, and that's about a 16th, so I'll have to move that over. About that much. And I'll mark the center of the door. Now this door is 1 and 3 8, so I have that would be 11 16 Make the mark and check it from the other side. Now I'll use my nail set to mark the centers. Now I'll show you what this 2 and 3 8 back set means. This is the latch and when that goes in place, this will be flush across here and the spindle that operates it will go right through there and that's the center line. Well, the standard size hole for a cylinder lock is 2 and an eighth inches. This has a pilot bit that I've started on the center punch. Drill partly through one side and then come in from the other. And now the latch hole, this is 7 eighths of an inch, but some will require 15 sixteenths or 1 inch. Now I'll put the latch in place, make sure that it's lined up on the sides with the door parallel. Use a hard lead pencil and mark the outside edge. When I take it out, I'll chisel this line and then route it with my electric router. Use a wide chisel now with a bevel in, but be very careful about this line. Too much pressure and you could really split that right out. This is just a score. Extend the line. Now just widen this a little. Well, here's the latch. I'm going to route this freehand. So here's how I set the depth. That's it. I don't try to make a finish cut with the router. The big advantage is to establish the depth. I stay away from the lines and then clean them out later with a chisel. I've marked for and drilled the pilot holes. Now I'll try the latch. All right, now I'll close the door and mark the latch. Now I'll set the depth of the latch with my square and then transfer that to the jam. First you mark the depth, then transfer the lines over for the top and the bottom of the latch. Put the latch plate up in place. Line it up for the cutout, and then mark around the outside edge. There has to be a hole in the jam for the latch to go, and that's called a keeper. It's bigger than the latch itself, so I'll just center it by eye. I've modified the spade bit with a chainsaw file, and it sure cuts nice. I want this strike plate to be flush with the surface of the jam, so first I'll mark the outsides of the plate. Notice that the bevel is in, and I'll make a series of chips and pair it out. I'll just guess at the depth. 
And when I pair it, I can take it down. Just like a Volkswagen. Before I leave the door, there's a couple other things I'll show you. Sometimes you have to cut the bottom off. A half inch would be the normal clearance on the bottom of the door, but it really doesn't matter. Just so it'll close the obstructions. Several ways you can go about it. You could scribe it, or suppose you had an additional floor thickness. It could be tile or an area rug or a marble threshold. Just put the material up and then mark it. Suppose the door has been taken down for new carpet and it needs to be cut off. Just take the measurement from here down to the new surface and then measure from the same point on the door. Now I'll show you how to cut the bottom of the door off. The bottom of the door is marked and I'll cut it using this cutoff guide. A veneer door like this often chips when the saw blade comes up like this. So I'll put the cutoff guide right there on the marks and clamp it in place. And now, score this with my utility knife. I don't need to score the underside of the door because the teeth are coming up. I use regular steel blades because I file them myself, but you could use a crosscut blade or a special veneer blade. Now I'll chamfer the edges because if you don't, you could lift the veneer and chip it. You can see that my plane is held at an angle, trying to avoid a chip. Well, there are other kinds of doors other than this one that's been hung in place. This is called a split jam. As you see, the jam separates. And so first you put this part in, plumb it, nail it up, shim it, and then rejoin it. Now one of the advantages is the joint is concealed by the stop. And also, you can use it on several kinds of wall thicknesses. That's a good unit. And finally, here's the disaster door. This is a 28 inch door that's supposed to go into this opening. It's only 27 and 3 quarters at the top. And 27 and a half on the bottom. Well, it looks like the head's about a quarter of an inch out of level. Check the sides. Well, that's plumb. But it's not straight. There's a good sixteenth of an inch crack through here. Check the other side for straight. And there's a bulge in the middle. Well, these are conditions you often run into in old work, and the door will have to be fitted to the jam. All right, this door should be pretty snug. Push it up tight to the top and put a shim under the bottom to hold it. Now, I cut the door by measure, and it just fits in the opening. Now I'm going to try to do all the scribing at the same time so I don't have to take it down each time and do one operation and then put it up and take it down again. You see the head's not level. So instead of using my scriber, I'm going to use these wood strips. I often use these instead of shim shingles because they're parallel all the way through. And I've chosen these because one is a sixteenth and one is a, an eighth. And I'll use the sixteenth on the hinge side and the eighth on the latch side. I'll just double them up and scribe down the, the line. Okay. 
The latch side gets an eight. And the hinge side gets a sixteenth. Next is the hinge location. I'll just use seven inches here. And when you mark the location for the hinge, you want to mark it both on the jam and the door at the same time. So use any kind of a straight edge. And it's a good idea to mark the hinge location because a lot of them have been put on the wrong side of the line. Down here on the bottom, I'll use 10 inches. I'm going to make a second mark on here because this is going to be the space left on the top of the door. And when I put the hinges on and put this back in place, you'll see these two lines registered. And the same thing on the top hinge. Now all I need to do is plane down to the scribed line. I'll make short strokes with the hand plane first to cut away the waste, then some long strokes to smooth the edge. I don't use the electric plane because this is a crooked scribed line and the long bed of the electric plane wants to cut straight. And that's it for this side. Now the hinge side is up and so I'll mortise for the hinges so I don't have to turn it around again. And that's about it. All right, now I'll flip it over and plane the other side and put the bevel on at the same time. Now that the sides are done, I'll cut the top. And using a finely tuned handsaw can be easier than a plane. Now it should go up without any problems. But I'll see you in just a minute. Hinges are mated. Pin's a little hard to get in. Do the bottom one. That's better. Now I'll close it and check the margins. Well, it looks pretty good. Here are the strips that I used to scribe it with. There's that one. And there's that one. It works. Well, that's the last door I have for you. And even though these doors and windows haven't been complicated, the procedure is the same for any door or window. I've been doing it for a long time. When you do yours, just take it easy and work accurately and you'll get it. Good luck.